we go. Hi, everybody. This is Marvin Rappaport. I'm a longtime member of the board of the Crawford Public Library in Monticello. And we recently started a project to record local history of individuals who grew up, uh, worked, played, frequented Sullivan County, but in particular, the, the area in Monticello, in and around Monticello, which is part of the service area of the Crawford Library, including the towns of Forestburg and Bethel, as well as Thompson. Today is the 16th of October, 2023, and we're delighted to have with us somebody whose history goes back a ways, who'll tell us about it shortly. Uh, it's probably, I think, safe to say, the only person who grew up in Monticello and ended up uh, or in, and accomplished being one of the individuals who shared in the Nobel Peace Prize. And before too long, we'll let him tell us about that. But his interest, his upbringing and his uh, education here in the Monticello area is of interest to us. And then he'll tell us about his travels uh, around the globe, around the country and his accomplishments. Bob, welcome. This is uh, Robert Schock. Well, thank you, Myron. Um, first of all, let me uh, thank you for the invitation to do this. Uh, there are some uh, very famous people uh, who have come out of Monticello and Sullivan County. And so I'm, I'm pleased that you even considered me to, 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 to be included in that. So go ahead. Okay, let's start with when and where you were born and when and why did your family come to Sullivan County? Um, good questions. Uh, I was born in uh, what was then the Hamilton Avenue Hospital in May of 1939. Uh, some of you are probably old enough to remember when there was a Hamilton Avenue Hospital. Uh, it, um, uh, I, I should say that we were known, we of the, the, the 1939 generation were known as the last of the depression babies uh, because the next year we were now into World War II and we now, now were called the war babies. <laughs> so I had a sister who was a, a war baby, but I'm the last of the depression babies. Um, what was your sister's name, Bob? Oh, my sister's name was Betty Ann, B-E-T-T-E-A-N-N. -N. Okay. And your folks? Uh, my my father was Carl Schock, and uh, my mother was, was Norma Greenfield Schock. And uh, I, I guess one of the, you, you asked how I came to, to, to be here. Um, uh, uh, I... Uh, I um, uh, I should say my father grew up in Monticello, um, and uh, my mother, though, had a, grew up in New York City in the Bronx, and she had a uh, an aunt who had a summer place in the Wurzboro Hills, and my two parents to to get get to the to keep it short, uh, my two parents. Uh, went out on a blind some that they set up a someone set up a blind date for them. And my father came down to Wurtz, the Wurtzboro Hills, and here I am. Uh, so. <laughs> Rough, roughly what year was that? When did they get together? Yes. Oh, I, I think it was like 1937, if I remember. They they told me, right? And I, so I came along a couple of years later uh, as the, old, the oldest, their oldest child. Right. I should say, before we go further, I should have said it earlier, they were also joined by Lynn Skolnick, longtime president of the board of the Crawford Library, who may chip in with some questions during the course of our conversation. And uh, Myron Gattel, who's also uh, very knowledgeable about local history, is on the call as well, but might not be participating in our conversation. So how'd you get to Kaimisha Lake from uh, Hamilton Avenue Hospital? Well, uh, we first lived in on Bennett Street in in Monticello. My, uh, I, I should explain that um, uh, the reason my father was in Monticello was because um, uh, of the, some shock family history, uh, which uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly cover. Uh, but 
there were four shock sons who had moved from the what's now the Czech Republic uh, to Germany <clears throat> uh, near Stuttgart, and uh, uh, they uh, uh, coming from the Czech Republic where beer is famous. They had a uh, a, a business making brewery equipment, uh, and they were very famous. They made brewery uh, equipment all over, and they moved to, two of them left and came to New York City. Um, and uh, actually uh, uh, wound up buying a whole city block on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Uh, and, and they then set up a brewery equipment business there. They also opened a bank, by the way. So uh, I think they were already well off when they came there. Uh, but the but how did I get to Sullivan County? Uh, uh, the interesting thing I think you'll find is that my grandfather came down with tuberculosis, and uh, in those days the the, the uh, regimen for someone who had TB was to move to the mountains, and so his his grandparents, uh, the 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 two shock sons, who he uh, one of them was was his father. Uh, they bought him a place on what's now Pleasant View Avenue, what I think always has been Pleasant View Avenue. Uh, and then uh, after I was born uh, and my mother, my mother and father had obviously gotten married, uh, we lived on Bennett Street, which uh, I don't know whether it's still called Bennett Street, but it's right across from Pleasant View Avenue. And we lived there till I was about three I think, maybe four. Uh, and uh, how did we get to Kaimesha Lake? Well, this gets into another interesting story, uh, I, I think anyway. Uh, the uh, the uh, A.T. Reynolds, who was Harold Reynolds' grandfather, I think, or may, might have been great-grandfather, um, had an ice company on High Street in Monticello. And, but, but where they got their ice was from Kaimesha Lake. They would cut it out of the, the ice on the lake in the, in the wintertime and haul it into Monticello. And at some point they decided that was, that was uh, a little too much work. And so they uh, built a couple of warehouses on Kaimesha Lake uh, and then uh, started the, the same thing that they had been doing in Monticello they continue to do that, by the way. Uh, they um, uh, uh, made artificial ice. They they set up an artificial ice company so they could make ice. And eventually, they they stopped cutting ice out of the lake because they they found they could make it uh, either in at High Street in Monticello or over in Kaimesha. But anyway, to make a long story short. Harold Reynolds had become a, a, a good friend of my father's. I think he was in Monticello High School a little bit after my father. Uh, and um, uh, to make a long story short, uh, he, they decided, the Reynolds decided they needed somebody living uh, at the place in, uh, in Kaimesha. And so they built us a house. Uh, thank you, Reynolds family. Uh, I, I say that to Bruce every time I see him, um, and uh, he um, th th they um, set it up, and uh, and and then then we moved when I was three or four over to to Kaimesha. and and that was like by the way a very different world for me. Uh, first of all, I had I had uh, grown up a little, but there were now woods close by, but they they continued, and for the for the rest of my uh, up up to the time I I moved away, uh, I just really enjoyed getting out into the first it was the fields and then it was the woods and 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 and, and all all kinds of things. So, uh, uh, Bob, let me just interrupt you for a second. Your mom continued to live in that house until she passed away. No, uh, she didn't. Uh, after my dad passed away in 1968, uh, uh, Harold decided he needed somebody to look, continue to look after the business. And my mother was busy with another business. 
Uh, and so uh, Bruce actually moved into the uh, to, to the house at, at, at that point. The house is still there, by the way, at least yes. the, the last time. I, but they moved moved it from where it was. Uh, oh. But it was a neat a neat house. It it didn't have a it had an upstairs attic which got turned into my bedroom at some point. <laughs> but anyway, I, that's a long winded answer, Myron, uh, 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 of how I got to to, to Kaimisha Lake. Let, let me ask you, we know now that there were a couple, three hotels across the street as it were across the road from the Reynolds plant. The Mayfair up on top of the hill, the greatest almost directly across. And then what did you say? There was a third one. The Fairmont. Fairmont along the way. Were they not in place when you were kind of at an age where you could remember five, six, seven? Were they already operating as hotels? Oh yes, they were there uh, as early as I can remember. Uh, and right. in fact, my the, the owners of those hotels would always, since since we were the the nearest uh, year round residents, they would always stop in and and uh, chat with my parents, and they became good friends with the Greatest's. <clears throat> okay. And, and that's uh, the only one that's still standing and in operation, not so much as the hotel, but as um, uh, a camp. Yeah, right, right, right. Oh, and I have I have some history with that. And um, well, why don't you tell us that? Tell us that history. Then I'm going to ask you what it was like going quote unquote uptown because you're really not in Monticello anymore. You're outside the village, maybe not within the village limits, but you're outside the sort of metropolitan part of the village. Yeah, and there were... you had to deal with getting uptown and going to school, the buses, et cetera. But we if, you were... want, if you want to go there first, then we'll talk about the greatest. Okay. We were three miles outside, roughly three miles outside of Monticello. Um, by the way, when I first went to school, uh, there were not school buses then, not for us anyway. Uh, we eventually got them, but uh, my mother would walk me across Route 42, uh, and we would wait every hour. There was a short line bus that came along down from Woodridge or someplace out there, and and uh, and I would get on that bus, and that was my school bus, and I'd do the reverse going home, and we'd go to the short line bus station, and and uh, and then I could walk up to the school. Um, you went by yourself. Your mom put you on the bus and then my mom, didn't go with you. I'm a, I, I think she probably took me the first several times just so I got used to it. Right. But no, uh, in those days, uh, at least we, we kids did things that uh, uh, a little bit risky today. Uh, for, for the listeners, let me also say this. There was no major Route 42 with James Way and stores and lefties and gas stations. In those days, it was a curved road that ran past what was Lewinter's bungalows, curved up into past Crystal Street, down into Pleasant uh, Street. So it's not like you were on a major highway, so to speak. It was still a back road in some respects. In some respects, although it was it was fairly well occupied. It was a, it was a good two lane road. Uh, but uh, the other thing I was going to mention that you reminded me of is that we went up a, a fairly steep hill, which you can still do on the on the old road, which is called was called Tollgate Hill, because oh. according to my father, at some earlier stage, the people who built the road up the hill uh, charged a toll to uh, to go up or down that that road. So we always knew it as Tollgate Hill. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. The, the, I yeah. hadn't heard that. And when you got to school, where what building were you in when you went to school on St. John uh, Street? Yeah, uh, no, on uh, on um, what was it, Prince Street? No, not Prince Street. Um, Bedford St. Street. Uh, Liberty. I, I, oh, I, I went to the to the Catholic school. Oh, St. Peter's. Saint oh, Peter's. Peter's. Yes. Which, was on Liberty. No, not Liberty. Oh, yes, Liberty it was. Road. Is it Liberty yeah. Street? Yeah. Liberty Broadway, Street. Liberty, Liberty Street. Street. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's where I went to school for the first eight years. And uh, that was an interesting experience in itself because uh, I'm fond of saying that when we graduated eighth grade, there were eight of us, four girls and four boys. <laughs> 
and I, I know I remember all of their names. In fact, Spencer Monroe is still around, and he was oh, a yeah. classmate. And basically, you went all through eight grades with those eight people. Yes, that's mm -hmm. correct. And, and but but it it varied from class to class. But we were the last of the Depression babies, and there weren't as many babies coming along. Uh, the next class you, I remember had twelve people. Sorry. Do you also remember the sisters who taught you? Yes, uh, there were four sisters who taught us. I, I can remember all their names: Bernadette, uh, Manuela, uh, Polycarp, and Rose Patricia. Uh, wow. And they were very good teachers. Uh, I, I, I will say that they uh, they could be very strict, but they were very good teachers. And the other interesting story is that three of the nuns, I won't mention names, uh, clearly favored girls. Uh, you know, it just sort of came out in the in the process of doing something. But Sister Polycarp uh, favored boys, and it was quite clear that she did. I, I, the thing I remember is that uh, of Sister Polycarp saying to my mother when she'd see her at church or some social thing, How's my boy? <laughs> well, that that got a message across to, and she did that with all of the boys. Uh, you know, I'm sure she did it with Spencer and the, and and the other people. Uh, how's my boy? <laughs> Great. What happened after eighth grade? Well, then of course I we, we all went to Monticello High School along with all of the 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 the, the kids who had come from the the other elementary schools. That were either part of the district or or not, uh, like White Lake from Wurtsboro, <clears throat> and so we all got to to go up, um, uh, go to go to Monticello High School, and that was just like heaven for me. Uh, ah. not, not that uh, St. Peter's was not, but uh, but I, it, it opened up a whole new world. How many people would you say roughly were in the high school in those days? Well, few hundred? I'm not sure I remember. I can tell you that when we graduated, when that class graduated, we had 82 people. Oh. You can multiply that by four, maybe, a, a, and then add another hundred or so. And uh, and, and um, that's, the, that's the number. So it's like four or 500. So while we're on high school, is there any memories that you have of uh, going to school there that were particularly, uh, you know, that stick in your mind? Oh, lots of them. I don't know. I, I'm not sure I know where to begin, but uh, uh, I think the, the, the thing Did that you play I, sports? Did you music? You know, yeah, clubs? I'll, I'll, I'll get to them. But I do want to say that uh, um, I very much appreciated um, uh, uh, getting into the high school because we now interacted. Our, our parents had come out of a generation where there were there was much more uh, what I'll call parochial in, in, in our interactions. There were much more, but now we all of all of us together could interact with with kids uh, mm -hmm. who had totally different backgrounds, and and that was just. So uh, to me, it was awe-inspiring, you know, that the, the, all, all these different kids had all these different backgrounds and religions. Uh, you know, the, our parents had grown up, I think, in an era. My mother grew up in a in a Catholic neighborhood in the Bronx, um, and and it, it was Catholic. It was old school Catholic. It wasn't even new school. There were the Italian Catholics were in a different part of the Bronx. Anyway. So we had uh, in high school to get back to the point. We had uh, we we now were open to what was going on, what what all the cultures that all of these other uh, uh, kids had come from, and uh, I just ate it up, and I think they did too. Uh, you know, we it, there were there was the Jewish kids, the the Presbyterian kids, the Methodist kids, the Episcopal kids, the Catholic kids, uh, it, it, and it was great. So. Um, that's that's one of the things that that I remember. There were lots of others. Uh, you mentioned sports. I uh, my, my diversion in sports is my father was the first 
person to letter in four sports in Monticello High School history. Uh, and I, I probably need to remind people these days that there were only four sports. <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, I, I so remember. so was fo football was one of them at that time yes say football, that again football, football baseball baseball basketball track, and track basketball and track yeah and uh, I didn't letter in any sports I only participated in one I ran a little bit of track but I didn't follow uh, in my father's footsteps in that regard. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I can remember being picked up on several occasions. I used to hitchhike. If, if I stayed for a uh, for a for a, a club or something after school, I, I would miss the school bus, and so I would have to walk down to uh, 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 Pleasant Street. Pleasant Street. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say play. I couldn't remember Pleasant or Pleasant View, but. By the Pleasant, police station. Pleasant, Pleasant Street and uh, uh, be picked. I'd hitchhike at, at that point. And, and on a number of occasions, more than one occasion, uh, I was picked up by somebody who had gone to school with my father. And I can, it, it, it just made such an impression on me that this person would, they, these people would always say, you have no idea how good an athlete your father was. <laughs> That's so, great. That's great. Paint uh, a picture Bob, for us. Marvin, Marvin, excuse me for one second. Bob, I th doesn't that speak to uh, the community spirit that existed at that time that you knew, uh, everybody knew almost everybody. And you yeah. say that invariably someone would pick you up who knew your dad and, and his accomplishments. Um, did was was that part of what you realized when you were growing up that that existed that that community spirit or was that something you came to understand later in life? No, I think I understood it then. I I I, I said my grandparents lived in the Bronx, uh, in in Woodlawn, uh, and my grandfather had died uh, in 1947, uh, but. And I would spend time with my grandmother, and I was aware that that was also a, a a closely knit community, but it was very different than the community in Monticello in the country for the reasons that I just mentioned. That uh, there was this diversity in in, in Monticello, which uh, uh, did not exist in Woodlawn, um, or, or uh, and I assumed other other communities, and it was. It was just great. Uh, it was a learning experience, and and uh, and I think we all learned. I wasn't the only one who was learning. Every all the other kids were learning. They were interested in what what I had done in parochial school, and I was interested in what they were doing in in the high school before I got there, or, or in the public school. So um, anyway. It, Bob, you, you mentioned in notes that we exchanged earlier that you were also in the chorus uh, science club uh, as well at, at the high school. Um, the science club is, is, is jumps out of me because of your background. Now, did anything you learn in science club or one of your science classes plant a seed for you about, you know, ending up in a life of science? Well, uh, yeah, it's interesting you should say that. Uh, science was not a big subject. It was not a separate subject at St. Peter's. Uh, and that probably had to do with the religious background. Um, but um, when I got to Monasol High School, I now took physics and, and chemistry. And that was a, a, a real opening thing. And you know? I mean, Mr. Bremenstuhl uh, taught those. Um, and, and that was a real eye opener. Uh, but, uh, I, I, I think my, 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 by the way, my favorite subject all the way through elementary school into high school was, was history. Um, and it still sort of is. And I didn't realize until later that I got into science because I, uh, of, of my interest in history. And I'll give you the example. I will, it wasn't until I got to uh, to college 
and I now started taking more science courses <clears throat> that I realized that uh, in history, I, we could we, we go back a couple thousand years. Um, in, in science, particularly geology, I could go back 500 million years. Now, <laughs> not, not with the detail, but, but there was the interest. What was going on then? Uh, and and uh, so anyway, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's another story. <laughs> I had the occasion to teach H.G. Wells the time machine when mm -hmm. I taught at Monticello High School. And I found it fascinating to help the youngsters picture what it was like on the spot that they were in 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, many hundreds of years ago and so forth. And uh, I never uh, had a sign. I never, uh, in, you know, felt it science was for me but if there was a place to sign up for a time machine i would go backwards not forward yeah, so yeah, yeah. i can appreciate that that's interesting um would by you the also... way in this in this if i could mention in the science club in high school i became the vice president for two years to to margaret chico uh, uh who became margaret i i can't remember um but um Anyway, that was so. So the, I think the interest in science was always there. Okay, could you set the stage for us on what Broadway looked like when you were a youngster growing oh. up? You, you mentioned Friday night outs and your folks shopping in different places. What? 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 I mean, a lot of us that grew up here in the '60s and '70s probably can relate because I don't know how different it was. But what were the stores that that jumped out at you that you frequented or your family did? on Broadway? Well, the first thing I would say is that, brought to answer the first part of your question, is that Broadway was very different on a wintertime daytime than a summertime evening, particularly Friday evenings. Uh, Broadway, I can remember on even, uh, summer evenings, uh, both sides of the street, both, both sidewalks, which were wide, uh, covered with people. Uh, just walking up and down. It, it was a, um, uh, a, a, a center for all kinds of uh, in, in interaction. Uh, if you get the, the picture, I, 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 I don't know, I can't think of anything else uh, that, 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 that matches it anywhere, uh, let alone Monticello on a, on a summer evening. Uh, yeah, well, uh, some of us right. lived through that. And that's, of course, the resort nature of it. What was it like on a winter evening? <laughs> oh, it was, it, there was no, well, hard, hardly anybody there. But, uh, <laughs> I, I go back, you, you mentioned the Friday night thing. Uh, my parents would, uh, you know, we, we'd go the three miles, drive into town. On, uh, it, was, uh, it was a ritual on Friday night. We'd go in. Uh, first place we would go was the Hammond and Cook. And my mother would... Uh, uh, put her dollar into the Christmas club uh, and my father would go over to the men's department because he knew the guys and they knew him um, but then we'd go um, I, I said that was the first place that wasn't the first place the first place was the victory market you could go to the there were really two two uh, grocery stores uh, the, the the victory and the a and p and my parents preferred the victory. Don't ask me why, but they did. Uh, some victory, would get... victory being on Broadway uh, over where near Garlic's is and the AMP around the corner on Prince Street. Well, the victory uh, went into where the Republican watchman had been before the famous fire. Uh, uh, but then it moved to, to, to what you're, you're talking about. Right. Uh, but anyway, that's the first place we would go. We get stocked up on the groceries. You didn't have to worry about frozen food melting and stuff like that. Uh, right. And and so we would um, we would then go to Hammond and do the Hammond and Cooks. We'd go to Fleischer's uh, and see what's new in in radios and TVs. Although TVs were relatively new. <laughs> On the corner of Landfield Avenue, for those who don't know. Yes, yep. right. Uh, they were and, the first ones to put a color TV in the window in the right. 60s. Yeah. And at that point, my father would go over to uh, Max Alpert's. Um, 
a metropolitan drugstore, which was across the street. And yep. my mother, my mother would go to Smith's store, the 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 women's apparel uh, apparel store, right? Yeah, and, uh, the, and, and the they Smith, knew her. And the Smith, of course, what, their daughter was Judith oh, yeah. K, who became chief judge of the state of New York. Oh yeah, and and yeah. I can remember go, uh, going there with my mother on a Friday night, and she would uh, be working, uh, helping her parents. Uh, and of yeah. course, she was in high school ahead of me by about three years. But uh... right, um, okay. And we didn't mention, you know, we're sponsored, as it were, by the library. Did the library play a role in your growing up, either in elementary or high school? Yeah, Crawford it's, Library it's, around you know, on Broadway. I don't remember. You can probably tell me which year it got started, but it. As I recall, it 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 uh, got started and grew up from something that was fair, fairly small. Uh, but yes, I would. Uh, my mother, uh, I can remember her taking me to the library and dropping me off, um, and I would just peruse books. But we could we could uh, borrow books from the library, and I think you had them for two weeks, and then you had to get them back, or you or you had to pay a fine. <laughs> For for every day they they were late, uh, so yes, we would we would use it and and I would uh, I I read a lot of books uh, there um, uh, borrowed from the library. We didn't have that many books at home. Okay, Bob, I, you, when you, excuse me, Marvin, when sure. Bob, when you were growing up, uh, was your mom home with you, or and did she go back to teaching later? Or was she teaching while you were growing up? No, I was. I, I was hoping somebody, as I said before, we were going to raise that. But uh, uh, when when we go, came from the, the the separate schools into Monticello High School, we were each interviewed by Kenneth Rutherford, Principal Rutherford, uh, and and it was a like an hour long interview. You know, he would go through all kinds of things. And uh, our parents, or my, at least our mothers would go with us. And my mother went with me. And and I mentioned in the middle of this, I opened, I always had a penchant for opening my mouth. Uh, she would, uh, I mentioned that she had taught school. And she, she went to teacher's college in New York City and then taught in New York City for uh, three or four years before she moved up to marry my father. Uh, so, uh, but Kenneth Rutherford, his eyes raised up and, uh, uh, uh -huh, you know, and, and he uh, uh, immediately, you could just see the wheels going to try to get my mother to come back to teaching which he did eventually, although it was Mrs. Rutherford who did most of the work, I think. She, she was a gem, uh, but they got her first. Uh, I was still in high school and they got her in as a, a substitute teacher. And, uh, and, and she always said, I like substitute teaching because they're all, all the kids are in somebody else's problem. They're not my problem. <laughs> But uh, but then after I graduated and I think my sister was still in high school, um, uh, they convinced her. I think it was Mrs. Rutherford who convinced her to take, take a, uh, a full time job. And she taught second grade. And I guess that's where you you met her. But not, Absolutely. I was teaching at the high school. But when we would have conferences and because I, I knew Betty Ann, who lived, who was my neighbor here, that's yeah. how I got to know your mom. So yeah. I understand now why you take credit for your mom's going back to teaching. <laughs> well, my, my mom didn't like, I will fess up to that my mom did not like my saying that. She wanted the credit for, for having convinced Dan Rutherford that uh, she should go back to teaching. Uh, but she loved it. Uh, and by the way, she picked second grade because uh, she said uh, the, the first grade teachers have got all of the, 
the wrinkles out, out of the kids. And by the time they get to second grade, they're serious. So <laughs> that's great. Bob, you, you mentioned you had some jobs uh, over the summers that you lived on Kaimisha Lake, uh, including working at Greatest and other things, ball boy, shagging balls. Tell us a little bit about what it was like uh, trying to make a buck, uh, you know, in the summers well, here. Uh, you were looking for things to do. And I think when I was 12 or, or certainly 13, uh, I somehow got the idea that I wanted to be a... Uh, my father would take me over and show me the golf course at the, at the Concord, which was just across the lake. Uh, and uh, so I got the idea that I wanted to be a, a golf caddy. So I went over, I, as I say, I was 12 or 13, and I found the who, whoever ran. Well, I'm, I have it almost on the tip of my tongue, the guy who ran the golf course at the Concord. The um, pro was probably Jimmy Demerit. Yeah, but I don't know who the the caddy master was. Well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, it, what what I did was I went over and saw whoever that was and said I'd like to become a golf caddy. And he said, "Well, okay, but the first thing you got to do is shag balls." And in those days, uh, I think the Grossingers was was famous for having a a a a, a, a golf tee. Uh, you know, a, a practice tee. Driving range. A driving range, thank you. And, um, and uh, but the Concord didn't. And so what it did was it would take the golfers who wanted to just hit some balls out uh, halfway down a fairway, stand them on one side and hit the golf balls over to the other side where I would be standing. Well, of course, if they if they duffed the ball, I then had to run out into the fairway while the balls the, the, <laughs> from the regular regular uh, 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 golfers were were coming flying through. Anyway, uh, I did that for a year or two, uh, and then but the 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 gratis, the greatest. Uh, um, people came over and said, uh, and asked how old I was. And they said, well, I'm going to be 14 this summer. Okay. Uh, I think we can hire him. And so they hired me to be the boat boy, the person who looked after their boats. They had about six or eight rowboats down on the lake. And my job was to look after them and to uh, see that the, the, uh, the guests got got uh, into a boat and, and uh, got a chance to, to enjoy the lake rowing around. So I did that. That was a great job because it was a short walk from my house down to the lake. Um, you remember what a tip was in those days? No, I don't. Uh, yeah. and, but I do remember that not everybody tipped. <laughs> right. And did you also get a chance to get over to the pool at the greatest? Yes, because uh, the, they had a pool. It was not a filtered pool, um, but it was a nice pool. And uh, they, of course, said I could use it. And uh, so I would walk across when I wasn't working and uh, and learned how to swim in, in the gratis pool. Okay. Any other uh, summertime jobs? Did you end up at A.T. Reynolds as well? Well, yeah, I did, because uh, at that point, Harold Reynolds said, well, I, or he and my father, of course, being great buddies, uh, he knew I was about to turn 16. And at that, there was something about age 16 that you could, uh, it, it, they could hire me. And yeah, you can get a work, work is permit. Yeah, right. Thank you. And, sure. and so uh, I got a worker's permit and I went to work. Uh, uh, packing frozen food in the freezer, <laughs> which was a of the whole one one of more than one of those uh, ice warehouses had been turned into frozen food warehouses, and so we would pack the uh, the the packages that were going out to the customers, uh, and that was that was my job for a number of years, a couple of years, and then when I became eighteen, I could get a chauffeur's license. And so I asked them if I could uh, drive a delivery truck, and they said yes. And that was that became famous because I wound up 
I don't know whether it, it, it Harold and my father made it happen or or I said something, but I wound up delivering to most of my father's customers. And so so they knew my dad and then they'd know me, at least during the summer, uh, dropping off. These are hotels, the, 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 the stores, all the, the places. By the way, um, I, I should mention, I don't think most people realize, but, <clears throat> but, the, but the summer, uh, the, the ice business in the summertime was a fantastic business. Almost nobody had refrigerators. Everybody had ice boxes. But I can remember we lived on Route 42 and, and, and the ice house was, uh, was on Route 42. And there would be trucks backed up. I'm not exaggerating. Tractor trailers backed up for a mile down Route 42 waiting to load up with ice. That's how how important a, a, a business that was in the summertime. In the wintertime, it was a little different, but uh, but uh, that just awed me that, uh, and they can- and How far away was that, was that ice being trucked? Um, how far away it was? The ice being trucked. In other words, how far from the area in Kayamisha did those trucks deliver ice? Oh, all over uh, Sullivan, Ulster, and and Orange County. Uh, you know that was a that was a big business. Um, Great, Bob. You went to college at some point. Now you're talking about being eighteen. Where'd you start off at school? And in college, uh, let's see. I I just I went to Orange County Community College for two years which turned out to be uh, uh, another godsend. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the lucky people in the world. Uh, uh, there were some fantastic teachers there. There was a math teacher uh, um, and, and uh, he also ran the bookstore by the way, but, uh, <clears throat> but I so want- we, we haven't seen it yet, but, it, but if Orange County was smart, <clears throat> they'd have signs up that said, Here's a guy who went to OCCC and ended up getting sharing the Nobel Peace Prize. It would be <laughs> on the walls in, in Orange County. Well, I had no idea you went to Orange. That's what a great starting point. Well, we'll, we'll talk about the Peace Prize in a minute, I, I, sure. I, I hope. Yeah, uh, we'll have time. We will. Well, I'm looking at the time. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll be okay. So where, where'd you go after Orange? Well, uh, I went to Colorado College, but I do want to say that that the the math teacher at at Orange County, and by the way, there was no Sullivan County Community College then. Right. So Orange County is where we all went, and um, uh, there was a teacher, a fantastic math teacher, and it probably doesn't matter to most of our listeners, but in in two years, I went through. We didn't study calculus then in high school today people do but i went through i got all 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 of my calculus and differential equations done in two years which is a lot uh and and uh that plus them side that's my that was my first geology course uh there and so i learned about the importance of history back a hundred million years ago <laughs> fabulous Great. Oh, and then you, you went to Colorado for your uh, then I yeah I bachelor's. transferred to uh, uh, Colorado College and I picked that for a number of, of of reasons. It was a liberal arts school and there was something about liberal arts that interested me. Uh, uh, not that I wanted to study it in, in particular, um, but but I wanted to to, to do that. So uh, and, and I got in there. But but Colorado College, I, I got into several places, and and I got in there, and uh, that's a private school, and they uh, we found out what it was going to cost my parents, and my mother and father both said we can't afford that, uh, and they were right. Um, <laughs> but just as I was about to take one of the other positions, uh, the college sent them a letter which said we have a tuition. Uh, payment plan <laughs> where you can pay so much a month. You don't have to plump out all this money. And so they said, well, maybe we can do that. <laughs> and so that's the only reason that, 
that I got in. If they hadn't sent that letter, I'm sure I would not have gone there. And it it was a great school. I mean, it had liberal arts. It also had, was, and the other reason I went there was it was had a very, very good set of of, of science departments, uh, which was a bit unusual for some liberal arts schools. Where in Colorado was it? In Colorado Springs, uh, right, okay. right below Pikes Peak. <laughs> Uh, yeah, near the academy. Yes, well, but it was before the academy. I actually got there while the academy was being built. And the wow. Academy is, if you haven't been there, the academy is north of town. Colorado College is right in town. Okay. That's the Air Force Academy? Yeah. As is the, yeah, the, the north of town, yeah. Yeah. At this juncture, why don't we do a little diversion? Because at some point you started going out with a lady who ended up being your wife, somebody, <laughs> somebody from Monticello, and we don't know where she fit into this timing, but she herself had a very interesting history, which maybe you could just summarize a little bit. And well, uh, when me... did you and Susan start going out? Uh, Susan Benton, yes. Yeah, Susan Benton. Uh, her father and mother ran the Republican Watchmen, which I'm fond of reminding everybody was was founded in 1820 something before there was a Republican party. And then they kept the name, <clears throat> just like the Democrat is still right there today. Um, and so um, uh, having run into Susan when I moved to Monticello High School, uh, I then got the, the gumption to when we were seniors, just early in seniors to ask her out to the junior prom and she turned me down. Uh, okay. And uh, to make a long, I'll make a long story short. Uh, you can fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So I wasn't gonna make any more moves. <laughs> and uh, it turned out she had uh, accepted a, 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 an offer to go to this prom for somebody else, from somebody else. Uh, but about uh, three years later, uh, she, uh, uh, whatever, got her gumption up and uh, and wound up at a, at a New Year's party where a bunch of us college kids were getting together and playing records and dancing and things. And, and she wound up in my lap in a, in a chair. <laughs> And and the rest is history. And then a couple of years later, we we were married. Great. Um, I don't know whether that and, answered your question. <laughs> yes. No. No. She had again. Her family had an interesting background. Um, why don't and, we? And she get... by, she by the way, I should say I I I, I shouldn't. I, I I this is really what you were after. Uh, she was very good. She was an incredible person. Uh, she passed away about six months ago, and, and uh, uh, she was an incredible person with a with a bunch of of very serious talents, a, a broad set. But the ones that she she worked on and fostered were music, art, and writing. And and the writing I think she got from her grandfather, who was uh, Mrs. Benton's father, who had run the Republican Watchmen for many, many years since the late 1800s. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, so, but but she, uh, she did all that. And uh, I'm fond of saying uh, we still have her, her artwork uh, in the family and among friends. Uh, uh, she sang in a number of choirs starting in high school. Uh, that's an important thing. And, uh, and she wound up uh, singing in a number of very good choirs, including the San Francisco Bach Choir, which is was very well known. Um, and then, and and uh, what she le has left us with is about seventy volumes of family genealogy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, incredible, each one of them. Uh, wow, a, a volume in itself. So, Bob, let's talk about the Nobel Prize. You go to school in Colorado, you study science. Where do you go and how does that put you in a position where your work ended up contributing to what ended up being the Nobel Peace Prize? That's a good question. Uh, first of all, it was the Nobel Peace Prize, not a science prize. Uh, 
uh, and uh, secondly, um, uh, we 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 were awarded it. We were awarded half of it, I should say, and and we is about thirty people who had been put to who who were put together from around the world uh, in, in energy, uh, and and we. Uh, published something called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1960, uh, excuse me, 1977. Uh, so it goes back to the early days of that and the, the Nobel Committee decided we should get half the prize. And who got the other half? The other half was, was Vice President Al Gore. Oh, right. <laughs> Pretty good compliment to your work. <laughs> But, At a uh, time, Bob, when climate change was not in the vernacular of daily no, conversation. No, but we, we helped make it there. And I have a very nice plaque on my wall. I won't bother showing it to you. Uh, uh, it's all framed. And it says the Nobel Peace Prize. And it's got a copy of the, the, of the original award. So let me ask you, here you are from the 70s, and now we're in the 2020s. It's almost 50 years later. You, you guys, you guys and gals, you professionals, told the world to be on the lookout for what was going to change the world in which we live. Has it gotten as bad as you thought it was going to be? Has it gotten not really as bad as you thought it was going to be in terms of climate change? This this year is the hottest on record, summer, etc., and we've had all of these climate events, is it pretty much what you all looked in your crystal ball and predicted back then? Oh, I wish I could say yes, but no. Uh, we, we, we were basically trying to figure out uh, uh, what kinds of things could be happening. And I think we all knew that the climate had changed in the past and was going to change again. What we what we didn't know, we but we we asked the question was how fast it could change, and uh, and that's what we uh, that's what our, our our story basically says. So, and are you still involved in research science now? Yes, uh, I, I should say. Unfortunately, uh, it just occupies all kinds of my time. Uh, <clears throat> I still have an office at the laboratory and. Uh, Although we don't use the office anymore, none of us use the office. We work from home these days. Um, and the laboratory is in a place called Livermore, and that is where in Oakland, in the Oakland area. No, it's actually east of it's in the east in the hills east of Oakland. I see. Um, and it's a town called Livermore, which has about uh, oh, probably a hundred thousand people these days. And the laboratory, when I went there, and we didn't get into that, I went there, uh, by the way, to uh, spend a couple of years and then go back to the university. But uh, I, I, I found that I could do, whereas I could do one, uh, uh, three out of 10 things at the university, I could do 10 out of 10 things. Uh, and I don't know why I, I should have said no, because you can't do 10 out of 10 things. Um, but anyway, um, uh, I'm not sure where we were going. So the, the laboratory uh, had about, uh, when, when I joined, it, it, uh, it had about 10,000 people. And I eventually wound up uh, leading all of the energy programs, which included some of the, the climate stuff. And you had an occasion to travel around the globe and uh, be part of international committees as well. I'd noticed when you sent me some notes, you had been in sabbaticals in Germany and Australia, among, just to name two. Yeah, those were two sabbaticals, but I was traveling. I was on, uh, for example, I was on the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which meant uh, traveling all, all over the place. And I was on several uh, energy, international energy uh, groups, panels, if you will. Uh, so I was doing a lot of traveling. Susan, uh, I'm not sure was terribly happy with that because, <laughs> you know, I was I was heading off a fair bit. <laughs> but uh, this was in a in a time when uh, 
uh, air travel was a lot more comfortable than it is now. Yeah. I can say. <laughs> so as we're winding down a bit, is there anything that we didn't ask you about, Bob, that you'd want to talk about in terms of your your life? And then I'm going to ask you, what is it about growing up in Monticello that has been the most significant thing in your life? Do we leave anything out, Bob? Well, no, I'm not sure we left anything out, but uh, um, uh, the, the growing up in Monticello, I think the, the whole place was was very crucial to my uh to my being able to to pick up on things and and try to grow with it and uh um and it was although i don't live there now and haven't lived there for a number of years we do have a place there by the way uh, but um it was a it was a very un unique place like i was talking about with this ability to to get cross culture and, and to grow uh, and to learn that you could do that. Um, and you could, uh, as I found out, you know, I didn't know going into it that, that I could uh, <clears throat> be working in, on, in international groups. That was not my goal, but it just sort of happened. It, but it happened, I think, because uh, I learned how to, uh, to interact cross-culturally uh, in Monticello. Great. Bob, when did you buy, uh, buy or build the house in, in Sullivan County? Um, and, and how often did you come back here from California? Well, I didn't build the house in, in the house in Sullivan County um, is, it, is on a lake, Wanasink Lake. And um, it was my parent-in-laws, my wife's mm -hmm. parents, uh, I was their summer house to start with, and it became their retirement house. And then um, uh, Susan uh, uh, inherited it, and uh, along with her 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 brother and her sister. But they then decided they didn't want to con continue in it. So we still you have it. Want to think? You mentioned the family house. One of the things we didn't ask you is about your kids. Can't let you get away without telling us you know what children you had and what they're up to well i we have susan and i had three children we have three children uh, they're all either in their 60s or the last one is about to turn 60 uh and they live in they all live in california uh two in the bay area and one in southern california names. and they're all pardon their names oh uh, their names are pamela uh, Patricia and Christina, all three girls. Uh, we, by the way, we then got uh, four grandsons, no granddaughters. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, and and by the way, they've all been, I'm just very proud of them. They've all been very successful. I, I won't go into to the kinds of things they do, but they, they're very successful people. Uh, Do they relate to the Monticello upbringing at all? I mean, they didn't live here, but they no, know but the they, history and the culture. No, but they all spent their summers, uh, so, some of their summers, uh, at the lake, um, and and so they got to know uh, a, a fair bit, uh, and, and they still can recite things, uh, you know, from from that experience. So, uh, um, and and of course, the lake is a uh, is a multicultural community as well because it has people from all the surrounding counties who have summer places there and so there's a diversity of it, yeah uh, it's hard to, for some people who grew up here it's hard to believe that people in orange county would have a quote unquote summer home on wanna sink which is like 23 miles from where they live well, and out of up as well, but but it is a different culture in a different world, and it's still a beautiful vacation community. But I will tell you that uh, when my parent, my my wife's parents, uh, and Herb Weiss was the other guy, bought a place at Wanasink, it was almost entirely Orange County people, and nobody mm -hmm. spent the winters there. There was nobody there in the winter, so which is very different now. Right. 
Well, Bob, thank you for spending time with us and reminiscing a bit, sharing your experiences and underscoring what I think is the purpose of this program, which is to share with our viewers and listeners the fact that people from all different backgrounds and all different places whose parents or grandparents came from all over the world settled here in Sullivan County in a very multicultural environment with a resort, thriving resort industry for at least, what, 75, 80 years, although it's changed, and have had experiences in education and interaction that have helped them throughout their lives. So we, we wish you continued good health good times and uh, thanks for all that you've done for us and hopefully the world will start listening to your and your colleagues predictions about climate change and we'll be able to improve the environment that we live in well well thank you this has been a as i said before a, a real pleasure for me uh and, and a real honor uh to, to to be here so thank you very much thank you bob thank you